Hello everyone, I am Sana and welcome to today's lecture which is about post-traumatic growth. The objectives of today's lecture are, first is historical perspective to post-traumatic growth, second is meaning of post-traumatic growth, third consequences of trauma, fourth theoretical perspectives of post-traumatic growth, fifth is factors of post-traumatic growth process, sixth is the dimensions of post-traumatic growth. Let us begin with the historical perspective to post-traumatic growth. Many works of literature and philosophical ideas have advanced the idea that there can be some personal gain from suffering throughout human history. One noteworthy inspirational contribution to positive psychological thought appears to be Viktor Frankl's 2006 book, Man's Search for Meaning, in which he portrays tragic optimism as a human ability to transform suffering into success and accomplishment. Frankl argued, I quote, We are challenged to make the most of our unchangeable fate by surpassing and expanding ourselves or, to put it another way, by altering ourselves. And the same is true for the tragic triad, which is pain, guilt and death in that we can all learn from our mistakes and use them to be better ourselves. We can also use guilt to make changes for the better and use life's fleeting nature as motivation to act responsibly. Abraham Maslow, another renowned individual who made significant contributions to the concept of growth after suffering, remarked that facing challenges inherently serves as a prelude to self-actualization. In the light of the foregoing, one could argue that although many trauma survivors have always experienced post-traumatic growth, this phenomenon was not discussed in scientific discourse until the 20th century when it was a subject of systematic theory and empirical research. The term post-traumatic growth was initially used by Tedeschi and Calhoun to describe the positive psychological transformations that clinical psychologists Tedeschi and Calhoun saw in their patients as they dealt with extremely stressful and challenging life situations. Notably, they discovered that after being exposed to the traumatic events, people frequently reported experiencing positive changes, including feeling more connected to others around them and finding more pleasure in life. A few research from the 1980s that revealed positive changes in rape survivors, bereaved people and combat veterans seem to have begun sustained scientific inquiry into positive growth. In 1990s, the construct gained more momentum with more systematic investigations which included the groundbreaking work of Tedeschi and Calhoun and the development of psychometric scales for the measurement of the construct. Currently, this seems to be a global paradigm shift among trauma researchers and clinicians away from the earlier perspective of viewing trauma reactions or outcomes often as negative or pathological to promoting positive or beneficial psychological changes following the trauma. Let us now talk about the meaning of post-traumatic growth. Each person experiences the aftermath of extremely traumatic circumstances differently. Many people describe positive growth after adversity, despite the fact that some persons demonstrate negative decline and others report no change. An individual may be impacted by exposure to a traumatic incident either directly or indirectly and may experience post-traumatic stress disorder. The adverse symptoms may include low social aspirations, anxiety, fatigue, depression or withdrawal. Numerous studies have been conducted on the notion that people may also undergo beneficial changes as a result of trauma since 1990s. This upside of trauma may include increased inner resilience and spiritual enlightenment. Post-traumatic growth is a theory that explains the kind of positive growth after trauma. The theory which was established in the middle of 1990s by psychologist Richard Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun contends that persons who go through a psychological struggle after experiencing bad experiences frequently experience positive growth. 
Numerous studies have been conducted since the idea was first proposed in mid-1990s on the possibility that survivors of traumatic events may go on to have beneficial transformations. Post-traumatic growth is a term most frequently used to describe these beneficial improvements, although other names for them include benefit-seeking and adversal growth. Let us now briefly discuss consequences of trauma. There appear to be two opposing viewpoints on the effects of trauma. First, trauma's harmful effects disrupt of the body's and mind's proper equilibrium, which makes a variety of physical and mental health issues worse. Traumatic events are specific, frequently unanticipated and occasionally life-threatening. People experience loss of threats to their personal goals and well-being. Examples include divorce, financial difficulty and life-threatening disease. How each person responds to the trauma varies. While many people frequently endure anxiety, despair and somatic illnesses or pain, some people only experience minor disturbances in their daily lives. For individuals who witnessed or were impacted by trauma, being exposed to it is a terrifying experience that can have serious and long-lasting psychological repercussions. Second, there is a positive side to trauma, the constructive impacts whereby victims adopt a positive attitude on their traumatic life experiences and subsequently undergo what is known as post-traumatic growth. People that undergo post-traumatic growth develop new goals for themselves, take on difficulties and make new acquaintances. The severity of person's symptoms and problems can vary depending on a variety of factors such as the trauma's severity, the person's natural ability to handle stress, the person's life experiences prior to the trauma and the support they receive from friends, family and professionals after the trauma. Let us talk about another objective of today's lecture, which is theoretical perspectives of post-traumatic growth. Theories have suggested various models to describe the concept of post-traumatic growth. The most prominent are the functional descriptive model, organismic valuing process theory, and the biopsychosocial evolutionary theory. First, we will talk about functional descriptive model. According to Tejasri and Calhoun's functional descriptive model, traumatic life events can and frequently do have positive results. The process starts with the experience of a traumatic incident, which is claimed to fiercely test and demolish the individual's presumptive beliefs and aspirations, which are known as schemas, resulting in extreme emotional pain if the event is sufficiently stressful. The assumptive beliefs are a collection of broad assumptions about the world, such as that it is predictable, manageable, and merciful that influence how people behave and interpret their experiences. The validity of the aforementioned essential beliefs appears to be called into the question by traumatic occurrences leading people to doubt their perception of the world and their place in it. Thus, the person unconsciously and automatically engages in ruminations about the trauma in an effort to cope with the trauma and lessen the accompanying distress. The individual starts to use various coping strategies including self-disclosure and solicit for support from others to help him or her manage the emotional distress and rebuild the damaged assumptive beliefs and goals that is schemas because the cognitive processes activated by the trauma are typically intrusive and unwanted. After some of the emotional distress has subsided, the instinctive rumination changes into more deliberate and intentional reflections about how the experience has affected the person. Positive growth is stated to have occurred when purposeful thinking is generally beneficial concentrated on uncovering benefits and meaning as well as reappraising the traumatic occurrence. This model also explains how traumatic events act as seismic challenges and shatter people's pre-trauma goals, beliefs and pre-trauma schema, including their capacity to handle emotional discomfort. 
Tedis G and Calhoun and other researchers use the seismic metaphor of an earthquake to describe the process of post-traumatic growth. This metaphor captures the suddenness and power with which the pre-trauma schema is shattered. The reconstruction efforts make people following an earthquake are similar to the trauma. Victims attempt to rebuild their shattered assumptive reality while attempting to come to terms with the catastrophic event. Additionally, people who have gone through extremely traumatic events have the chance to carefully consider how they wish to rebuild their life during the cognitive processes deliberate rumination phase. As a result, by taking into account the circumstances as they are and the knowledge that they have survived the traumatic incident and related distress, individuals may create adaptive beliefs that are likely to increase their resilience and help them deal with future challenges in life effectively. By incorporating the positive changes that have taken into their life narratives, people become conscious that they have evolved in significant and meaningful ways as they move forward in life. It has been said that while some trauma survivors would never want to remember the events leading up to the traumatic event, many of them are aware that these events had a positive impact on them. Next is Organismic Valuing Process Theory. This theory emerged from Joseph's person-centered theory, which argued that post-traumatic growth occurs following a very stressful life event because people naturally have a propensity to understand and integrate their experiences while pursuing optimal well-being. This theory was deemed to be too limited in scope, so Joseph and Lindley revealed the person-centered theory to create a new theory known as the Organismic Valuing Process Theory, which aims to provide a more thorough and sophisticated theoretical framework for explaining the growth phenomenon. The Organismic Valuing Process while not significantly different from the earlier, which was person-centered theory, emphasizes people's innate ability to determine what is important to them and the things that are crucial in fulfilling their life goals. The theory's underlying tenet is that humans are inherently motivated to progress towards growth in the wake of painful experiences. Three potential cognitive consequences for the psychological resolution of trauma-related issues are presented within the organismic value process. First, the idea that trauma events are assimilated, returning a person to their pre-trauma baseline, but also making them susceptible to re-traumatization in the future. The second is the idea that trauma experiences are accommodated negatively, resulting in psychopathology and distress. Third, because a person has adjusted his or her worldview in light of the new traumatic information, trauma events are accommodated in a way that promotes growth. Let us now talk about one more theory, which is biopsychosocial evolutionary theory. The biopsychosocial evolutionary theory proposed by Christopher contends that individuals' concept of self, society, and nature that is, metaschema, are shattered and reconstituted when they experience trauma as a normal response through an inherited evolutionary mechanism that takes place simultaneously in the biological, psychological, and social domains and leads to learning. Christopher reached a lot of overlapping theoretical conclusions while presenting the central idea of his viewpoint. In the first place, stress is a pre-rational type of biopsychological feedback that depicts how an organism interacts with its environment. Second, growth rather than pathology is the normal result of traumatic stress. Third, the inappropriate or dysfunctional modulation of stress response is a major cause of psychopathology. Fourth, that the biological and psychological functioning of victims of trauma is always increased. Fifth, while there are universal biochemical processes driving stress response, the specific dynamics peculiar to a stressed individual are always a product of his or her own social cultural environment and psychological makeup. Sixth, even while the psychological symptoms of psychopathology remain unchanged, the biological factors underlying them may change.
Seventh, rationality is the most sophisticated stress reduction behavioral mechanism that humans have ever developed. It is also a crucial step in the restoration of victims trauma, psychological health. In addition, the biopsychosocial evolutionary theory proposes that three categories of factors which are capable of converting stress into positive adaptation and development seem to be determinative of the difference between outcome of the normal day-to-day -day stress responses and the pathological stress responses. First, the biological health of the person and their capacity to utilize the resources at their disposal to cope with the stressful incident. Second, the capacity of the trauma victim to convert stress and anxiety into learning, meaning, and adaptive behavior. This includes the victim's cognitive capacity to organize and comprehend trauma-related information. Third, the social relationships that were available to the trauma victim during the traumatic event were complex, responsive, and flexible, which serves to facilitate the reduction of the intensity of stress arousal. The effectiveness of the neural networks, that is cognitive schema, and the endocrine system in turn, determines the degree to which these three elements influence an individual stress response and consequences. In conclusion, it could be argued that the core tenets of functional, descriptive, and person-centered models of post-traumatic growth seem to align with biopsychosocial evolutionary perspectives, core assumptions that traumatic stress can result in growth, and that psychopathological outcomes may be caused by maladaptive modulation of stress response mechanism. Let us talk about the factors associated with post-traumatic growth process. First is distress. A variety of unfavorable situations that may cause distress, a feeling of vulnerability, unpredictability, and a lack of control over one's life are implied by the traumatic experience. Despite this, the person might concurrently believe that combating the negative trauma has brought them rewards. According to certain studies, there is a negative correlation between distress and PTG, meaning that if a survivor has greater level of PTG, he should be able to overcome the cognitive disruption and as a result experience less distress. According to a study by Linley, positive changes predict less PTSD symptoms and lower levels of despair and anxiety after a traumatic incident. It should be noted that not everyone who experiences growth after trauma reports a reduction in distress. Recent studies reveal that these seemingly antagonistic conceptions are actually mixed and coexisting concepts. Studies that support this idea claim that greater PTG scores are correlated with higher levels of distress and PTSD symptoms. Second is emotional disclosure. Disclosure of one's emotional responses to a traumatic occurrence aids cognitive processing since the person is more willing to accept various perspectives while explaining the incident to make it comprehensible to others. These perspectives aid in the cognitive elaboration of the traumatic events. Recent studies have demonstrated that the degree of growth indicated by survivors is influenced by their emotional disclosure of circumstances associated with major traumatic occurrences. Additionally, the advantages of self-disclosure are discussed in this literature and its impacts have been linked to improved immune system functioning, less distress and improved physical functioning. Third is coping strategies. The type of cognitive processing that is adopted and the sort of coping strategy used instantly after the trauma affect the degree of growth that will be noted. In reality, both emotional and problem-focused coping are positively related to PTG. Conversely, coping with denial, repression, and emotion suppression is linked to less favorable health outcomes. Fourth is social support. Social support affects how well people cope with and recover from stressful situations, which makes it a predictor of PTG. As an alternative, the perception of improvement in a variety of aspects of the survivor's life may open doors to the most meaningful connections, kinder actions, and new acquaintances and friendships, which turn social support into an outcome. 
it is known that there is a bi-directional relationship between PTG and social support satisfaction, but not enough research has been done to say if social support actually improves PTG or whether the effects of perceived growth are what lead to greater satisfaction with social relationships. Fifth is environmental characteristics. Gender, age and education levels are three environmental characteristics that have been linked to perceived growth. According to empirical research, women, younger people and those with greater levels of education are generally more likely to report growth or benefit findings. Sixth is assumptive world. The term assumptive world was presented by Jane F. Pullman to refer to a set of basic beliefs that shape how people see the world, other people and the future. That framework for understanding the world may be destroyed by a significant stressful experience which may result in a cognitive restructuring of essential beliefs. This in turn may have a dominating effect on the reconstruction of the personal story. The perception of personal battles and fresh possibilities, possibly a route to the emergence of PTG and the perception of positive benefits are revealed after reconstructing the disrupted cognitive framework with the knowledge acquired while struggling with the trauma. Seventh is rumination style. After a traumatic occurrence, survivors are troubled by intrusive, typically unpleasant thoughts about the incident that invade cognitive processing without permission or intention. Without the person's consent, this kind of thinking takes the place and is typically linked to higher degrees of distress. Deliberate rumination, which differs from intrusive rumination, implies that the person willingly thinks about the trauma with the clear objective of trying to understand the event the changes it brought about and the implications for the future may take place within cognitive processes. Eighth is spirituality and religiosity. It is acknowledged that having spiritual beliefs and engaging in religious activities significantly influences how people perceive growth. Adversity may lead to a stronger connection to religion and clearer knowledge of spirituality related concerns. In reality, certain empirical studies have shown beneficial connections between spirituality and religiosity, cognitive functions and perceived growth, but because spirituality is such a complex concept, it might both help the PTG and contribute to its downfall. Ninth is optimism. Apparently, optimism and the PTG processes are associated according to some empirical research. The use of adaptive coping, a positive understanding of potentially dangerous situations, the expressing of happy emotions and seeking out social support are characteristics that are frequently found in an optimistic person and may help people perceive positive changes after trauma. Bostock demonstrate in their meta-analysis that optimism appears to enhance PTG, although it is still unclear how these two different and independent constructs are related. Now, let us talk about one more objective, which is the dimensions of post-traumatic growth. It is commonly known that people who experience trauma report feeling stronger, more reasonable, and capable of dealing with challenging situations in the future. Such beneficial improvements frequently go unreported by trauma survivors or are hardly ever linked to the terrible situations they have gone through. On the other hand, researchers and clinicians have suggested that post-traumatic growth may occur in five human dimensions, namely personal strength, change in priorities, improved relationships, change in philosophy, and spiritual development, and let us discuss them one by one. First is personal strength. Following a traumatic experience, people have an increased sense of personal power, confidence, self-awareness, openness, empathy, creativity, maturity, humility, and ability to deal with future challenges. Survivors might have more positive perceptions of themselves and feel stronger and more resilient. According to research, trauma experiences increase one's appreciation for life and help one realize that certain life situations are neither predictable nor controllable. Second is change in priorities. According to Lindstrom, can, 
Calhoun and Tedestry, after a traumatic event, people undergo cognitive reconstruction, which enables a better understanding of life and subsequent adjustment of priorities. The trauma survivor may adopt a healthier and better lifestyle, be more selective in choosing friends, or even change his or her entire life goals as a result of the change in priorities. In some life-threatening situations, the trauma survivor may decide to change careers and learn new skills in the belief that they have been given a second chance. According to Joseph and Lindley, a traumatic experience may inspire a newfound admiration of life, leading the person to start appreciating the little things in life that they have never considered to be significant before the trauma. Third is improved relationships. After enduring traumatic events, people may develop a stronger emotional bond with those in their social networks and develop deeper ties with their neighbors, friends, and even total strangers. After a traumatic event, survivors seek assistance from family and friends as they attempt to make sense of what happened and deal with the suffering it has caused. As a result, individuals frequently experience warmer, more loving, and intimate relationship with others as well as a revitalized feeling of compassion for those who are going through particularly challenging circumstances in life. Those who have survived traumatic events and experiencing growth are likely to report that their social network connections have improved in certain aspects. For instance, following a tragic event, people may cherish their friends and family more and feel a greater sense of altruism toward others. Fourth is change in philosophy. According to Tejasri and Calhoun, people who have been exposed to trauma are more likely to become cognitively engaged with basic existential questions about dying and the meaning of life and have a higher understanding of meaning and purpose of life. They go on to state that the cognitive engagement process involves the questioning of pre-trauma beliefs and a greater understanding of existential or spiritual issues by trauma survivors, which causes emotions of vulnerability and mortality. Questions like, why do such tragedies happen? What is the essence of life and existence? And why should I continue to struggle? preoccupy the minds of trauma survivors and have been shown to result in an increased degree of awareness and a more meaningful and fulfilling way of life philosophy. Fifth is spiritual development. People may perceive an improvement in their religious beliefs and a sense of growth with regard to their religious devotion or spiritual life as a result of exposure to traumatic events and extreme hardships. This could intensify following the traumatic experience and boost the person's coping strategy as they open up new life opportunities. In the lack of clear explanations, research has revealed that people turn to religion to try to make sense of their traumatic experiences and to respond to the why philosophical issues. As a result, trauma survivors may experience some improvement in their religious or spiritual beliefs such as more frequent prayer, gratitude to God and a stronger faith as well as a development of a new philosophy of life that opens up possibilities and opportunities that is positive changes that did not exist before traumatic event. With regard to the dimension of post-traumatic growth, there appears to be an agreement on the idea that an individual does not necessarily need to experience positive changes in all the five domains to confirm that growth has truly occurred. For instance, according to studies, the occurrence of positive change in one or two of the five domains may be sufficient to confirm the presence of growth. Furthermore, Tedestri and Calhoun posited that emotional distress may still exist even in the context of growth, implying that growth and distress may coexist or be felt simultaneously as a result of traumatic events. So we can conclude different human communities and cultures frequently put forth their own social structures and justifications for the experience of suffering. Many times the psychological effects of extreme adversity are given interpretations that tend to support an ideology of illness. 
For instance, people including medical professionals often describe their experiences in psychopathological terms like post-traumatic stress disorder when faced with difficulties and challenges and sufferings. But there is now a new arena for discussion about how going through painful experiences can result in positive outcomes put forth by the discipline of positive psychology. Events that are really difficult are all too common in people's lives, but it now appears that these impacts are not always negative and may even lead to an improved sense of self, in contrast to the widely held belief that post-traumatic stress disorder is obvious this new perspective that post-traumatic growth which examines alternative traumatic experiences and encourages the idea of growth presents a positive psychological perspective to traumatic stress response. That brings us to the end of the lecture. Thanks for watching.